He had a he had a vision of a of God on his throne, folks you know from all over the world around the throne worshiping him, and you know folks just saying over and over again, "You're this, you're this, you're this, you're this" to God, and he said, "There's a you know you're right, you know you're you're right, yes you." I agree, you're, you're, you're correct, I am that. But the folks that really caught his attention were the ones that were doing his will, not merely telling him what he already knows, and, you know, really putting their lives on the line to, to do his will, even to the point of, of dying, of folks still all over the world, um, you know, putting themselves out there to the point of death for our God. So I, I just, I think of that particular vision often enough. Anyhow... As I, you know, I, I'm trying to be careful in my prayers not to tell God what He already knows about Himself. I know that those songs and stuff are to, you know, we we want to maybe encourage our own trust or our own faith, which is fine for what it is. But God already knows about Himself. Anyway, uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 53 through 72, basically to the end of the chapter. And this is the trial from the Sanhedrin, and uh, this is basically in brackets I put two stories of going off the rails. Well, this is where we look at two different people, two different individuals, as we put it, going off the rails, and we'll kind of compare the two. But I will read this bit, 19 verses. Beginning at verse 53, it goes like this. They led Yeshua to the Kohen Agadol, that's the, the big guy, the big priest, if you want to translate it literally. Large priest. Large priest, yes. <laughs> they led Yeshua to the Kohen Agadol, with whom all the head Kohenim, the, the head priests, elders, and Torah teachers were assembling. Kepha followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the Kohen Agadol, where he sat down with the guards and warmed himself by the fire. The head Kohanim and the whole Sanhedrin tried to find evidence against Yeshua that they might have him put to death, but they couldn't find any. For many people gave false, t false evidence against him, but their testimonies didn't agree. Some stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another one not made with hands. That should be a duh kind of moment there, but you know. Even so, their testimonies didn't agree. The Kohen Agadol stood up in front of, in front, and asked Yeshua, "Have you nothing to say to the accusations these men are making?" But he remained silent and made no reply. Again, the Kohen Agadol questioned him, "Are you the Mashiach, Ben Ha Mevarak?" "I am," and this is. Lots of folks will note the eight I am statements in John. This is in Mark chapter 15. It is an emphatically spoken I am, uh, completely echoing Exodus chapter 3. Are you the Mashiach, Ben Hamivarak? I am, answered Yeshua. Moreover, you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of Hagibarah and coming on the clouds of heaven. At this, the Kohen Agadol tore his clothes and said, Why do you still need witnesses? You heard him blaspheme. What is your decision? And they all declared guilty and subject to the death penalty. Then some began spitting on him. And after blindfolding him, they started pounding him with their fist and saying to him, Let's see you prophesy. And as the guards took him, they beat him too. Meanwhile, Kepha was still in the courtyard below. One of the serving girls of the Kohen Agadol saw Kepha warming himself, took a look at him, and said, You were with the man from Nazareth, Yeshua. But he denied it, saying, I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. He went outside into the entry, and a rooster crowed. The girl saw him there and started telling the bystanders, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. A little later, the bystanders themselves said to Kepha, You must be one of them, because you're from the Galil. 
At this he began to invoke a curse on himself as he swore, I do not know this man you are telling me about. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. Then Kepha remembered what Yeshua had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And throwing himself down, he burst into tears. Well, simple note. I have often counted some perishim, some Pharisees, as following Yeshua, quote-unquote, at a distance. We, you will recall... Uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. well, I, I have often noted, and I think we've all noted, where we'll talk about the Pharisees following Yeshua at a distance. No Pharisee has been mentioned by Mark since chapter 12, so Pete takes up the slack, though with perhaps a different tone. Now, I'm not trying to pick on Peter necessarily. I'm just wanting to point out that he is following at a distance, just as it says the Pharisees did. He just got a different tone. I'm not trying to, you know, paint a broad brush here. And yes, I would like to say that not all Pharisees are quite so bad as anti-Semitic history makes them out to be. But, making points, or Mark points out, making points, Mark points out that among the number of false testimonies, the accounts didn't even agree. The Sanhedrin, run primarily, if not totally, by the Sadducees, was very much like a modern political party. That is, though it may have been swept clean and orderly, it was quite empty. When Kohen Agadol, the big, grand, large priest, asked, Are you Mashiach Ab bin Hamavirak, son of the Blessed One, that is? Yeshua answers affirmatively with, I am. He then quotes the important Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, and Psalm 110, verse 1. What he says next is a quote from that, and very highly messianic. Yeshua answers affirmatively with, I am there. Now, Yeshua did not hesitate in his affirmation of being the Messiah, okay? He did not hesitate in saying he's Messiah. And if it weren't enough for the big guy, or for us, he referred to himself in the exact same manner and verbiage used by yod heh used by the Lord to Moshe in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Which they would have known. Which they would have known, yes, uh, hence calling for blasphemy. Apparently some quote-unquote scholars assert that the Synoptic Gospels do not contain any claim that Yeshua is the Messiah. And I have read that. Perhaps Messiah is not enough. So, if necessary, we will refer to such passages as this one for all the more evidence of just who Yeshua is. He's not merely Messiah. Yeah, he's Messiah every bit of the Messiah. He's also, by the way, God. Okay. The passage contains no small matter. This is, this is not a small thing in this passage. Thus, understanding the words of Yeshua to be a clear case of geduf, or blasphemy, the Sanhedrin sentenced Yeshua to death. That, according to Leviticus 24.16, says, you blaspheme, you profane the name of the Lord, and in this case, calling yourself the Lord himself, then you're worthy of death. So, sentencing, sentencing, finding in him blasphemy, the Sanhedrin sentenced to shoot to death, and then some decided to, you know, torture him a little bit. You know, that's part of any proper trial, right? But, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. I've got a little bit more note, but any thoughts about what I've just said so far? No? I don't think we have any argument among us about these passages, but if you have anything to say, I don't want to just keep talking. All right. I, I, I get surprised when I read commentaries that say, well, there, there's really not enough, you know, within the Gospels to, to really come up with the conclusion that Yeshua, that Jesus is the Messiah. He, he never really said those things. Well, wait a minute here. I'm pretty sure he did. I, yeah, I think, uh, anyway. 
Okay. <laughs> Kepha's denial of ever knowing Yeshua, of not knowing, knowing him at all, is well known to many of us. Mark uses an immediately in the case of uh, Yehuda's betrayal and another immediately here in the case of Pete's denial and specifically the second crowing of the rooster. So uh, three denials within two cock crows. I'm doing a little KJV there. Quote, and throwing himself down, he burst into tears, end of quote. Now, both Kepha and Yehuda, both Peter and Judas, came to this point of deep anguish due to each of them going off the rails, if you will. But Pete was willing to walk the long road of untangling the sin that so hampers or impedes forward motion. Judah may not have even considered such a humble struggle. Okay. Returning to the Lord after you have, you know, when you come to the point where you have immediately, you can admit to yourself, yeah, I went off the rails. I, I, I went a little sideways, so to speak. But to actually walk the path back, that requires some deep humility, and it's a long, tough road. It's not going to be easy. Pete was willing to go there. Judah was not. Even today, many would believe that a utopia is certainly at hand, and so throw a fit because we are not jumping right into it. Yet we know that long-suffering, quote-unquote, must precede Hasidut, the complete lifestyle of covenant grace characterized within that utopia. The road of repentance is never said to be easy, but the course of teshuva is certainly necessary. The course of repentance is certainly necessary for slika, for forgiveness, shalom, and capital L life, haya. I'll read it again. The course, the path of repentance is necessary. For forgiveness, for wholeness and peace, and for capital L life. I think we live in a time, particularly in America, and I'm not trying to just pick on America. I'm sure there's other places of similar similarities where we, you know, conven convenience tends to be our new God, and we feel that you know, poof, is the the way that a miracle happens. A miracle is something that's you know got it's magical. It's poof. Happens right away. I don't find that necessarily. I find, at least in my life, that the Lord orchestrates things and when He puts His finger into my world, it may actually be something that I did not expect at all. No, it's out of the natural. It's sub supernatural, yes. But it may not be all that glorious either. It may not be all that convenient. But it is his end. So I feel that when we encounter the need to come back to the Lord, make that necessary walk, yes, it's going to be a little bit of time. It's going to be a struggle. But it's okay. It's a good struggle. So with the first sentence of that paragraph, even today, many would believe uh, that a utopia is certainly at hand and so throw a fit because we are not jumping right into it. What do you, what do you mean by that? There is a, a feeling, okay, I've, I've encountered this, I'll go ahead and say this even on Facebook Live, this is, I, I'm not picking on individuals here, there's a lot of folks that are believing similar philosophies, but... Uh, oh, people that believe the, that this is the thousand year reign? This is the thousand year reign, or... You know, basically, now there's two different forms of, uh, of uh, um, preter preterism. There used to be just one. Now there's um, partial preterism, which is pretty, it's more or less the full preterism. I don't really see a difference. Um, which says that the, you know, God was through with the Jewish. I think the only partial, the partial part of this is saying, well, maybe God wasn't through with the Jewish people in AD 70. But that's, that's all. That's the only difference. The preterism basically says God was through with the Jewish people in 87, no more covenant with them. That, you know, sure, go ahead and kill them all. 
and therefore we are now living in, from that time forward, the millennial era, the, the utopic messianic reign, we just don't know where the guy is. That's not the only philosophy, though, that kind of leans in that direction. There's a lot of folks that feel like, well, things are so good, we've basically taken more or less care of world hunger. Well, I mean, folks still jump into socialism like Venezuela, and so, yeah, there's going to be world hunger as long as people are stupid. But generally speaking, a lot of folks feel, well, you know, there's so many good things right now that we've taken care of. Surely the utopic era is here. Why are we not, you know, why are we not there yet? And why are we not really, you know, seeing that in its fullness? Why are we not jumping into 6G, you know, or whatever, you know? It's, What's 6G? Well, I mean... Are you referring to the phone and stuff? Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, we're, we're kind of into coming into 5G and, and things moving so quickly. We may as well, you know, next what? month be 6G. 5G is a marketing ploy. It doesn't actually exist. Okay. You but, like 4G. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we want things to move so fast, as in poof. Uh, you know, we're, we're jumping out of the real world, so... Delayed gratification is not gratification. Yeah. <laughs> right, delayed gratification is not gratification. So, the, the matter that I'm saying there is that, you know, reality is that you do have to struggle now, and you do have to kind of put some effort out, and no, we're not in utopia yet. No, the Messiah hasn't come back a second time yet. No, there's there's a lot of things yet to happen. But we'll we'll still have to, even when he comes. Chat. Just as before sin entered the world, they worked the garden. Even when he comes a second time, I'm sure we will busy ourselves. Wait. Does anybody actually throw a fit about that, or is that was that just a turn for you? Well, <laughs> oh, about um, are are there people who follow preterism that would throw uh, throw a fit if you don't follow preterism? I don't think so. No, but the same spirit that believes that we we most certainly should be in a utopic situation, or or you know, if it's not fitting with our our grand That's idea cool. of what satisfaction is, then you know, we must throw a fit. So do you think preterism is born from that uh, want for gratification? There is a rise in that particular philosophy, so maybe so. Preterism was born out of the uh, Counter-Reformation. It was part and parcel of the Counter-Reformation. But, uh, but it, you know, the, the idea behind it is most... The, the, What's being said and what's being felt, I think, is, well, there's, surely we're in the Messianic era, you know. Surely that began in AD 70, and we've been living it ever since. We just haven't completely realized it and brought it forth ourselves. And I can understand that particular matter. I feel, personally, I feel like if, you know, if everyone in the world kept, the sh kept Shabbat, kept the Sabbath, the millennial area in Judaism is called the Great Shabbat, the Great Sabbath Day thousand year Sabbath day. So if everybody kept the Sabbath day all over the world, it would be, you know, it would be the first day of that time period. So I understand the feeling there, you know, why are, why, do, why are we twiddling our thumbs kind of thing. But I, I do see not, not Christians, but folks that still have that feeling like, man, it's any day we got to jump into this. Throw a fit if something goes a little sideways. And yes, I'm referring to such things as a, a presidential election every four years. And if the guy that gets elected is not your guy, then let's just march in the streets and break windows. You know. <laughs> and of course, That's, I'm, I'm thinking, it's like, boy, if this is the millennial reign, but it's really undermining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like... But, you know, so... I, I just what I'm saying what I'm saying here is there's still this thing in the Bible called long suffering. And sometimes we still have to deal with that. We still have to go through that in order to get somewhere. I've been in every position that I've been involved in every position you can think of. 
Uh, I believe, you know, I sort of believe that yeah. you live, if you live into the kingdom, that means you're, you're aiding in bringing the kingdom to bear. Right. I think that's a logical, uh, but, you know, that, that that's part of that. Mm -hmm. But, predicism is, I forget what the, I know that there's two sides of it, I don't know which side you call it, but mm -hmm. there's pre preterites and Partial. Po partial and post. I call yeah. them post. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's largely the, it's the same thing, they're all called preterism, but, but it's, it's basically saying that the, the Messiah came back in AD 70, that was his second coming, and he destroyed the temple, that was his first deed in coming back. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, that, it doesn't, it do it's reported how many Jewish people died, by the way, in that particular act, and it's comparable to the Holocaust. Now, okay, um, <laughs> what you're saying here is that the Messiah came back, destroyed his own family, and that's how he began his reign. But, you know, so I, I know that we 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 want to say, well, it's here, of course, the Holy Roman Empire, and so on and so forth. But no, no, we stay faithful to him. That's why I just always said, uh, what. Love, you okay. love the Lord God, you you know, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because mm -hmm. I've seen every side, I've heard every side, and no side seems to make a total picture. Mm -hmm. But every side has some truth with it. Sure. And as long as I just try to keep it simple, uh, I'm not a simple-minded person, but I, I realize that well, I've heard this, I've heard this, and I've heard this. And uh, like my wife, she studies everything, and she's really firm on what she believes in. Sure. Uh, and I and I believe too firmly, but I believe firmly in doing what he tells me. I, you know, and if, when he doesn't, or when I don't, I know I don't. Yeah. Well, you, you gotta come to you know grips with where you're leaning. And well, I, I was talking to a nice lady today, a loveless lady. She's 90 years old, broke her hip. About three months ago, comes to drives herself to work every day. Was bending over today to pick something up. You know, he's just and we got into a conversation. She said, you know, well, you went to a she said Jewish school, a yeshiva, some years ago, and I said, yeah, yeah. And um, and I told her, yeah, in my in my DNA, yes, there's a Jewish strand. You know, Henry married Magdalena and so on and forth. But um, but I told her, I said, I don't lean on that. I lean on the most Jewish man who ever lived, you know, yeah. the Messiah himself. So you got to figure out, do I really lean on him? Do, Kepha, Peter, are you going to say in the tough moments when it come, when the rubber meets the road, you know, yeah, you, you were with him. You're part of his in, inner group. You're part of the 12. Are you going to say, no, I don't know him? You know, when it comes to the word the rubber meets, not when you're with... Yeah, not where you're with fellow church His members. rubber didn't meet the road there. It met it later. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it's kind of hard to... The only difference between Judas and Peter is the fact that he he repented. He let, let God straighten him out mm -hmm. because God loved him. And God loved Judas, too, but Judas didn't want to hear it. Yeah. That's the difference. It was like uh, in what? in study with in study last night. <clears throat> Remember we were talking from Revelation chapter the end of chapter three, and uh, we pointed out last night in our study that that he says, you know, I those I love, I confront. I confront the yeah. Yeah. So that's that's part of it. it if the Lord ignores you, I didn't see that. <laughs> You're sneaky. <laughs> I the reason I compared Peter to the Pharisees with the phrase that's used for both the Pharisees and with Peter, he followed at a distance, is because there, you know, he confronted the Pharisees. He confronts Peter. You will deny me. Don't don't say all this stuff. You're going to deny me. 
What did he say to the Sadducees? He talked to them a grand total of three times. He said, you don't know scripture, you don't know God. I would much rather him confront me and be honest with me rather than ignore me only to say you don't know me. So the important part here is well, knowing, knowing where you stand with him. Now, we were saying last night, and I've said this a few weeks ago, we're in God's house now. We're not in our own. He, we, you go into somebody else's house, you kind of expect to you know, check out the way they live, note their rules, note how, you know, their surroundings. It may be different in my house, but I'm not in my house. I'm in the Lord's house. And it's funny, it was last night we were talking about him knocking on his own house, saying, let me come in. So the point here is, yeah, let me come into the church, please. But the real point here is, know where you stand, and if you note that you have gone off the rails, maybe you have run from the Lord, and you, you know that now. There is always room, of course, to come back to him, but it's going to be a difficult road. It's not going to be, you know, roses all the way. You know, <laughs> coming back to your friends in that kind of fashion, saying, hey, I was, I was wrong. It takes some humility. Peter had that. Yeah. He, you know, I mean, right away, two roosters crow and he falls down in tears. I mean, he knew he goofed up. But it takes some somebody with a degree of humility to just say, hey, I was wrong, I blew it. He was a strange mix. Mm -hmm. But he was on the right side. He yeah. was humble, and yet Peter didn't act humble on the spur of the moment. Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to go there. I mean, all this... You know, we're going to say, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm really not that guy. I, you know, I, I'm just like, I can, I can identify with, with you. I know you're really out there and stuff, but I can identify you with you. And yeah, we all can. Mm -hmm. But you know, and Peter saying, I don't know him. But I think we've all been there a little bit. But it's important to be able to come back. It's not going to be a poof thing. It's not going to be an automatic thing. But it's important to make the journey. Okay. Let's carry on. Now we are at Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. Sir Tell, mm -hmm. you knew I was going to ask. Would you mind, or could you please, read Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15? And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him unto, over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man a man called Barabbas, I guess how you pronounce it? In the Latinized version, yes. And that's good. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, they delivered him to be crucified. Okay, thank you, sir. This is simply titled Before Pilate. The last bit we titled it Before the Sanhedrin. Pontius Pilatus, Pontius Pilatus, I guess would be the correct way, was the fifth prefect over the Roman province of Judah. 
Yehuda, Judah, Judea, however you want to pronounce that. He serving under he was serving under Tiberius from 26 to 36 A.D. Later Roman governing folks were called procurators, 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 procurators. Yeah, every day. I'm not really good with some. Yeah, I'm. Remember I'm all. Years. That's that's a different Pro, thing. Procura yeah. Procurators. Procurators, yes. I'm not trying to say they're for. Yeah. Anyway, after what I'm trying to say here is Pontius Pilate was the last of a particular kind of Roman governor. They kind of raised him up a bit after him. The four Gospels, as well as Philo and Josephus, tell us of Pilate's flippancy at best and anti-Semitism at worst toward Torah and or Jewish customs, unlike Pilate's predecessors. Pilate's predecessors were fine with Jewish people. Pilate himself uh, had some problems therein. The so-called Pilate Stone offers little to no added information. There is a discovery called the Pilate's, called Pilate's Stone. It was a, basically a step made out of stone to, I believe, into the temple itself, but has an inscription on it, a little bit about Pontius Pilate, and really doesn't add anything different or good or bad. As soon as, King James says, and straight away, this is not one of those times in which I counted immediately statements of Mark, so perhaps I will say that Mark uses Ethios and its other two versions 41 times, because I missed this one is what I'm trying to say. But anyway, as we have noted in our study of Matthew, the binding, the Akeda, of Yeshua mirrors that of Yitzhak, of Isaac, as recorded in Genesis 22, verse 9. It says, they bound him. Abraham also bound Isaac. Again, this is what Scripture has spoken about for Messiah from the beginning. But still again, long-suffering is that which precedes resurrection and the promised land for any of us. This is part and parcel of Mark's message. Mark basically, as we pointed out in our opening remarks about the gospel in its whole, we said that it's divided into two main sections. That is, one about his silence basically saying we've got a duty to do here I'm not going I'm not spreading the word that I'm Messiah because I don't want it to inter interrupt my duty the second section is about the suffering Messiah the suffering and resurrection so Mark is really seeking to say you must go through the long suffering before you can come into that place of resurrection Yeshua's response to Pilate's, are you the king of the Jews, is literally, you, you are saying. This is what you're saying. Of note, along with the Greek text that is always following a Hebraic style, the Greek word lego is about what is said rather than what is spoken. Okay, I want to kind of make a little point here. What is said, that is what is communicated rather than what is spoken with your lips. That word is laleo. Communicated. communicated. The Bible will say said for what, how we say communicate. That is, lego is about the substance of what is said, whereas laleo is about the mere words that are spoken. For example, quote, we know that whatever the Torah says, he uses the word lego in substance. It speaks, laleo, to those living within the framework of Torah. Romans 3, verse 19. So what Paul is saying there, he's using those two different words. We know that whatever Torah says or communicates, what is saying in substance, it is saying to those that are living within that. Those who are outside of it can't hear that substance, that communication. Anyway, Yeshua is pointing out to Pilate that Sir Dude is speaking with some substance even if he doesn't realize it or get it himself. As the big priest made some ac accusing remarks, Peter is, or Pilate, pardon me, is amazed 
that Yeshua is staying silent. Personally, I see Pilate as being without the capacity to conceive what the Lord is doing, even within himself. I'll stop there and explain a bit further. What I'm really talking about here in the two different Greek words that are used is when something is communicated rather than just verbalized, rather than you just saying words, but you're actually trying to communicate it. What you're trying to do is get through to the person what you are seeking to communicate. You want them to get it. You want it to sink into them so that they really completely understand where you're coming from. He uses that word of pilot, you say, and he's using the word, the Greek uses the word lego there, meaning you, you, you're, you're saying it with substance, but there's a question mark of whether it really sunk into Pilate or not. And, you know, some of us believe over time, like, there's different takes on this particular passage. Did Pilate really actually get it? Did he kind of back away because he was beginning to understand? Or was his flippancy not allowing him to really fully take, take in what was going on? And I'm kind of leaning maybe toward he didn't really completely get it. I'm not sure if this is actually the case, but mm. I feel like I've that, that I've seen some some of Christianity take almost like a romanticized view of Pilate, like he was a really awesome guy. Mm. Is that a thing? People do that. There, well, yeah. Like I said, there's there's two different views when we get to this point. And added, I, I believe it's in John, where his wife comes out and says, hey, you know, don't, don't do this. I've had a dream about this man. Added with that, but Pilate himself, uh, he is, I don't, personally, I don't see him as all that cool of a guy. There is, because of primarily his wife, there is a view that, hey, he, he may have even converted, but I don't see it. I don't, I don't see any historical evidence. There is a, uh, uh, Becky and I have a book, um, Chronicles of Pilate or the, something of that sort, and it, it's an interesting book, and I don't know just how, you know, historically correct it is, but I personally have trouble seeing Pilate as the guy that, you know, he, he didn't really care much about anything other than his Roman position. What I can find of him basically speaks of me of a, of a leader. He, he grudgingly goes to Jerusalem to take care of some matters rather than um, up further in the Galilee where he's supposed to be. Uh, he would rather not have to do that. You know, Jerusalem is the Jewish place. And he, he seems to just not want to deal with those things. He's, I... I feel like what the Lord is doing here is trying to draw him, saying, hey, you, you, he repeats that, you, you say, you have some substance in what you're saying, you're saying I'm the Messiah, but I'm not certain that Pilate himself really completely got that. If he would have, all of a sudden he would have, yes, I think, converted then and there. And when you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, what else is there to do? But I'm not sure he completely got it. I'm repeating myself tonight. Here's something that um, this note, this little study Bible note, puts in that may play into that a little bit, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we've all probably heard, you know, it's, it's implied in that statement, are you the king of the Jews? Mm -hmm. Um, if he's declaring himself king, then in a worldly sense, then he's kind of assuming authority that wasn't granted to him right. by Caesar, mm -hmm. by the emperor. Uh, um, so, in a in a sense, it's sort of like uh, implying treason, implying that you know he's putting himself in a position of authority that Caesar didn't grant. Right. Now, uh, 
according to this, the Romans, I'll just read it, the Romans had bestowed the, the title King of the Jews on Herod the Great in 40 BC. Mm -hmm. Caesar Augustus, who was the emperor who bestowed that title, Caesar Augustus declined to extend this status to Herod's sons following the king's death in 4 BC. So in that year, many Jews rallied around the popular claimants to kingship, which encouraged subsequent Roman administrators to move swiftly against any rumors of aspirations to the kingship among their subjects. So this fitting back into Pilate being more of a politician, more concerned with his status and authority, um, and not really getting what he said, mm. he's looking at it as a political claim to uh, authority uh, in, in the Roman Empire, mm. something that can only be granted by the emperor. Yeah. That... And Jesus is playing on those words saying, and to fill in what you're saying, if you really knew what you were saying, you know, those are your words, but you don't really understand what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. if you did, you know, we'd be done here. Yeah. You, you'd be on your knees before me, not the right. other way around. Right. So that, that kind of fits in when you pick that little political piece, that little history piece in there. Kind mm -hmm. of fleshes it out a little bit. Right. And... Thank you for filling in the what I would consider the rest of the story. Um, to politicize, or to politicize, to romance, to romanticize Pilate would be uh, naive, I suppose. But I, I think we all want to see leadership, you know, saved. But I don't think Pilate was there. See leadership what? Saved. You know, but I don't think. I do not think Pilate was there. Um, his his flippancy would not allow him to see the real substance of what Yeshua was saying, or for that matter, any Jewish believer, you know, and follower of our God. You know, if is you have to be able to, you have to be willing to see into that particular blessing. You have to be able to see into that particular life. You know, sphere, if you will, and if you're, if you if you got your mind on other things, then you, you know, you're drawn away from that. Then you're not going to be able to see it. You got to want to. Okay. Thanks for the uh, conversation, and that's where I, I talked about capacity. It's basically what I'm saying. You, and capacity is something that we ourselves develop. You have, in other words, room. We all have a God-shaped hole. Yes, I agree with that. You know, you've probably heard that kind of terminology. I've never heard that before. Okay, well, that's an old terminology. We're, we're born with a God-shaped hole. But what I believe is we have to nurture... We're donuts. Huh? We're donuts. Um, <laughs> I, what I was thinking was a little more vulgar, so I'm not saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we, we have to nurture room within ourselves to accept something beyond ourselves. You know. All right. Let me carry on with this broad note. Perhaps meant as a pro-Judean side of Pilate, Sir Dude had a custom of setting free one prisoner within festivities, probably Torah, or that is Jewish festivities. Son of father or Bar Abba, Barabbas, and, you know, without the Latinized version, is Bar Abba, that's son of father. He's brought into the picture. He's brought into the picture, and so now we have two sons of the father. One of these sons is the proposed king of the Jews. The other is among insurrectionists. He's, he's among those who are, you know, mob mentality. It is far too common for us humans to become pro-rioters while casting such language of mutiny upon true lovers of peace, or even seemingly naive folks like Pilate. 
This is the common way of mobs. Individuals will be far less prejudiced than mobs. And a common prejudice among mobs is envy and jealousy. I say is because envy and jealousy go hand in hand. They march together. Envy and jealousy can imprison a person, or especially a mob, while making that person or mob so very small. It's a vicious circle, basically. So we have basically here a choice given within the Gospels. One son of the Father or the other son of the Father. One of those sons of the father is an insurrectionist, as the King James puts it. He's a mobster. He, he, he likes to drum up some mob mentality. The other son of the father is looking for peace. He's looking for shalom and to find that in people and put that into people. Those people have to have the capacity for that. Though. If you have no capacity for it, it's not going to affect you. you talk about that sort of thing all day long. you got to nurture capacity. So we, here we're given a choice between what Messiah is to look like. It's going to be a guy that's going to war his way into, you know, in mobster kind of style into our lives. Or is he going to knock at the door saying, can I come into my own house? Any other thoughts or questions there? I'll go a bit farther. It's 749. That would make it an hour. You know, give or take. <laughs> In mockery, rejoice, King of the Jews. And that is spoken in mockery, of course. Sir Brian, mm -hmm. could I ask you to read Mark chapter 15, 16 through 20? And the soldiers led him away inside of the palace, that is, the headquarters building, and called together the whole battalion. They dressed him in purple and wove thorn branches into a crown, which they put on him. Then they began to salute him, Hail to the king of the Jews. They hit him on the head with a stick, spat on him, and kneeled in mock worship of him. When they had finished ridiculing him, they took off the purple robe, put his own clothes back on him, and led him away to be nailed to the execution stake. Okay. Yeah. It sounds oddly specific when you think about it, but then when you, what they did, but then when you think about, or when you put it together with what Brian mentioned earlier, they'd probably been doing this to every other guy who claimed to be the king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And it was probably just, you know, fun yeah. that they developed over however many Rituals, so sure. to speak. Yeah. Who knows how many of them you know, decided to try that sort of thing. Rome was a powerful state. Probably more yeah. while Jesus was around than not. I don't know. Who do we have? I don't know. They, they did that as standard operating procedure for, I don't know how long, but it wasn't just with Jesus Christ. Oh, no. It, yeah, the sorts of yeah, stuff, I'm sure. If we recall the, recall, we weren't there, but, you know, I mean, we've read history. When you understand the, uh, the, the atmosphere, again, Rome was a powerful state. The influence of Rome is still with us today. And I, I think we understand that. But the, the way Rome operated, the, the emperor was an emperor. He was not merely a king. And so somebody to, you know, suggests that they were in this or this position when they were not granted that, as, as Brian well pointed out. If you're not granted that permission, that position from the emperor, then, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, let's have a little fun with this guy. He thinks he's something. He's not been given that position at all. You know, so yeah, it would be, uh, this is not the first time, nor the last. Listen. We're sort of like that today, you know, the government is. Sure. But the only difference is we pull politics of pulling the punches to whip them into shape instead of kill them into nothing. 
That's the only difference. Really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we we live within to get to that. We we live within something of a state kind of. You know, I still like the United States better than any other. Oh, most certainly, sure. I mean, goodness, I'm still here for a reason, and I will continue to be here for a reason. This is a wonderful country to live in, and yeah. far better than any country in a good long time. Although Israel is making some strides, but uh, the pardon. So you got to throw that one in there. Yeah, I got to throw that. Yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, Israel is all about innovation right now. And then it hands that innovation over to other countries, and we, you know, take it and go with it. Israel does go further with some of their own innovations, but Israel is very much in an innovation slot right now among the world. But anyway. Saying, uh, picking up on what you said, Richard, we there's a little bit of a tightrope that we that we walk as even Americans and people around the world, Christians in particular. We know who our God is, but we also, you know, we know who the state is, and we have to have this cooperation, right? That's just good sense, you know, lest you want to get in trouble, and you know, you want to live a peaceable life, quiet so, and happy life, quiet and happy life, right? Whatever Paul said. Yeah. Right. He he lived in the Roman Empire, mm. and he's you know Romans chapter thirteen. He's advising folks, hey, the emperor doesn't bear the sword for no reason, you know. <laughs> so kind of watch your step. But you know we we've been given power and authority, but not power and authority to go and be stupid. Pax Romanus. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. So my note here, um, hare or hario. The Greek word here appears as a common greeting within the Greek New Testament. So I'm thinking within the time period, it probably was, you know, kind of like a, you know, shalom today, or we say in America, um, hey, how are you doing, stuff like that. In, you know, England, they might say cheers or something. Uh, this was a common greeting. So, hare or hareo means rejoice, literally, while shalom means wholeness and then peace. Here the greeting is clearly given in mockery, just as the royal purple robe and woven crown of thorns, as well as the beating and fake worship, be a clear matter of mockery. Yes, the position of worship is kneeling and or prostrating oneself, but true worship is a matter of the heart, otherwise it's mere physical position. No, I'm not against bowing, kneeling, or lying face down in worship. I'm not, I have done that myself. At Grace Harbor, you, uh, some of you might have been there. I demonstrated on what the word, in Hebrew, what the word means to worship, and I got down on my face. I'm not against that. But what I'm saying, if it doesn't come from the heart, you're merely getting down on the floor. Yeah. Um, but, you know... Where worship begins is in the heart, then it rightly flows to other expressions. So, so here we're talking about a difference between acting, you know, the mockery here, you know, acting something out, out of, in this case, out of, you know, fun and disdain. But there's also the, you know, you put on a mask, you put on a persona. But when it really comes from the heart, then... Yeah, folks around you will know, but more importantly, God himself will know. So that's when it's real. Is, how did you say that, Hiro? Yeah, Hiro or Hare. Is that Hebrew or Greek? Greek. How long have, have like, a, like a, uh, Jewish people said Shalom as a greeting? Actually, shalom as a greeting goes back to scriptural time, the time of even what we're reading here in the first century. It was beginning around those days, shalom as a greeting, and even a little before. But, you know, because you're wishing somebody wholeness, peace in their life. You know, well, you know, it's, it, it sounds, you know, akin to the Roman greeting, you know, which uh, I think which translated to, you know, the command to be healthy, right? you know, that's, you know be well, that sort of thing. So yeah. kind of, it's a similar, just, you know, the greeting as, you know, a well-wishing upon you or whatever, that yeah. sort of thing. Right. Different from the American greeting where we pretend to care about it. Yes. <laughs> Shalom, by the way, is also the word for health. 
So Word. being as whole, it, it first means wholeness. So yeah, wholeness. if you're wishing somebody health, you also say shalom or shalom aleka. That's health mm -hmm. to you. But the or shalom alekem. That's health to you all. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the you know that's just. But here it's done in mockery, or you can you can say. In other words, what I'm saying here is you can say praise the Lord, you can say I worship you, Lord. And those are wonderful words, but if you're not actually complimenting Him or worshiping Him from your heart. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, it doesn't ring quite as, you know, true if you are saying, it's like, hey, be healthy while you <laughs> beat him up. You know, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't yeah, hold quite the same meaning. Yeah, you know, yeah. keep it real, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, but hey, maybe you're like, Maybe it's like a be healthy. Or a, yes. Maybe it's like a wish. It's like, like I hope you don't die from this. Latest. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like a paper work. All right, I'll read this. And the, again, this is going to be last week we talked about a little Mark thing where Mark brings out something that only Mark does. This is going to be one of those instant, instances again. Mark 15, verse 21 says, a certain man from Cyrene, Shimon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the stake. And I simply stopped there because uh, one of those little interesting things. Now, all the Gospels mention this, but Mark goes a bit further. A fellow named Shimon apparently fathered Alexander and Rufus. Rufus is mentioned one other time, that passage being Romans chapter 16, verse 13, which translates as, Greet Rufus, the chosen in the Lord, and the mother of him and of me. Wait, what? Rufus is a woman. <laughs> now, Rufus is a man. Pardon him, Rufus is a... Greet Rufus, the chosen... Greet Rufus, you know, oh. this, this dude... Oh, greet Rufus and his mom. Okay. Yeah, greet. I'm just I'm <laughs> translating this directly, you know, straight down from Greek to English. Greet Rufus, the chosen and, I, and the Lord. I should put a common right there. A comma, pardon me, not a common. But um, yeah. See the the importance of the. Uh, are you assuming Rufus is gender? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Along with a name like Rufus. <laughs> I thought that was a dog myself. <laughs> yeah, that, just that is kind of delight, delight, nice. Yeah. You have rough. She must have found out this dog. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, the the yeah, so like, you know, Rufus doesn't really sound like a very biblical name. But, you know, so yeah, Luke, neither does Mark. So. Greet Rufus, the chosen in the Lord, and the mother of him and of me. So sure, Paul and Rufus may have been kin to one another. But I may be more likely, it may be more likely that the mother of Rufus was very much like a mother to Paul. And then again, you know, we, we I, I, <laughs> this is one of those things that Mark does where he adds just a little bit more information. <laughs> and so, and, and in Romans 16, the last chapter, Paul goes through a litany of really putting some folks, you know, on a special little you know, saluting them as family. And some of them, the, he calls them brothers or sisters. And so within that total context, and he's talking about Greek names and such, within that total context, he may be referring, probably referring to Rufus, the mother of Rufus, as someone very much like a mother to him. But just, you know, the way it's stated, you know, Mark doesn't use the words like a mother or, Paul doesn't use the words like a mother and didn't use the uh, comparison kind of language. But but I just, I'm picking on that because Mark is very specific. Okay, carrying on. Mark, 20, or Mark 15, 22 through 32. And I'll go ahead and read this. And then I'll probably swing around to a close. Mark 15, 22 through 32 looks like this. They brought Yeshua to a place called Golgotha. Golgotha. Gol 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 it is actually... Golgotha? Yeah. It's actually Hebraic. It means place of a skull or skull place. Golgotha actually means just simply skull. But um, 
And they gave him wine spiced with myrrh, but he didn't take it. Then they nailed him to the execution stake, and they divided his clothes among themselves, throwing dice to determine what each man should get. It was nine in the morning when they nailed him to the stake. Over his head, the written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. On the execution stake with him, they placed two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And the verse that we don't know whether to put in or not says, uh, and the passage from Scripture was fulfilled, which says he was counted with transgressors. Uh, that's a verse from Isaiah 53.12. That's a, just an old, older manuscript, but I thought I'd throw it in as well. Um, Are you about to close your notes? I am. Oh dear. <laughs> it canceled. Yeah. Pardon me. Definitely don't hit, don't say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People passing by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! So you can destroy the temple, can you, and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself and come down from the stake. Likewise, the head Kohanim and the Torah teachers made fun of him, saying to each other, He saved others, he can't save himself. And so he's the Messiah, is he, the King of Israel? Let him come down now from the stake. If we see that, then we'll be, believe him. Even the men nailed up with him, insulted him. So my simple and again, I, I'm saying that kind of in a parenthetical statement here, in Mark's presentation, his whole gospel presentation, he's trying to say in the overall message, this is going to happen to you too. As a follower of this man, you're going to get jeered at, you're going to get mocked, you're going to, you know, so you're this and this and this, are you? So he's trying to say that to say, in, in order to get to, can I say chapter 15 and 16? You know, in order to get to chapter 16, you're going to have to go through 14 and 15. You know, you're going to have to go through these things. All right. But on the plus side, you're going to stay. Mm -hmm. huh. Be that. Okay, the, the, <laughs> the lifting up of Mashiach, the lifting up of the Messiah. This is 9 a.m. Wednesday morning, A.D. 31. Matthew fifteen twenty two through thirty two. Mr. Shimon, with Mr. Shimon carrying the stake, Yeshua was brought to the place of the skull, or skull place, Golgotha. Having said that he would not drink from the fruit of the vine until, again, until the full kingdom of God was established on the earth, Yeshua declined from drinking anyway. I never made that connection before. <laughs> Pardon? I never made that connection. What connection? The the you know. Well, when I get that was at the Last Supper, right? He said, "You know, I won't drink this cup again until it's like." And there he, and while he was crucified, he refused the wine. Yeah. Like I never made that connection before. Uh, what? I know that there are still like some places where it's people will drink alcohol more than they'll drink water, just because the water is so terrible that right. it's better to drink alcohol. Is was it like that in Israel? Was he, was he akin to saying something like, I'm not going to drink water again until... Well, the first, uh, there's a couple of things there. First, the, you know, the Passover has four cups of wine, you know, four, four, drink, four separate times of drinking a sip of wine. And that is to recall the four promises of, you know, Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. The final promise being... And I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's the established kingdom on earth, the fully established kingdom on earth. When he says, I will not, in this particular point, if I will not drink it again until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God, he's saying that I'm not going to drink it again until I come again and establish all of this. Another matter, the other matter that you spoke of, is Israel has never been a great place of water. Uh, there's Now, the Jordan River was once upon a time much bigger than it is now. If you look at a, uh, what do you call it, I uh, uh, can't think, the, the kind of map that shows you the terrain. Uh, the top, topographical? Yeah, thank you. 
uh, topographical map of Israel, you'll see the Jordan, the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River Valley, if you will. Uh, you can compare it to the Jordan River of today, and you can see that the Jordan River was a good deal wider once upon a time. And there's politics involved in that as much as anything, but, the, you know, once upon a time there may have been a bit more water, and the Jordan River has always been somewhat muddy. So Israel, to this day, struggles to, you know, they're, they're finding all kinds, they're actually some of the innovation that comes out of Israel is how to make clean water. And they've now, as of the last year or two, developed a machine that you sit in your house and it collects the air. It collects water from the air. Right. It collects water from the air. So they do that because there's, you know, water's not plentiful. So, yes, wine, when the Bible says strong drink in the King James, that's probably beer. There's been discovered a great many beer distilleries in the Middle East, Middle East in general. It's basically where beer came from. So, wines and beers, and I'm not talking about, you know, hard liquor. Uh, that's a modern, a little bit more of a modern conception. But, but just simple, you know, fairly low alcoholic content, wines and beers were quite common because water was simply not plentiful. Was what? Simply not plentiful, never has been. So, when you're, when you're in the vicinity, lots of folks vie for whatever water there is. That's why I said politics continues to this day to be very much a part of that. The, the matter of wine, the matter of any alcoholic drink that I will say is the Bible is not coming into his presence drunk is prohibited. You'll find that actually in the Bible. But it doesn't say don't drink wine. In fact, it actually commands with a few offerings to do so, but I will say this, if you lack self-control, <laughs> you know, if you lack self-governance, one of those steps of growth, no, I mean, don't, don't be silly, don't drink the wine, because, you know, if you lack self-control, you're going to drink more and more and more, so, anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. So what's not commonly known is that at the Last Supper, it was actually <laughs> and there were 12 apostles and mm -hmm. that's the 12 step program mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he was swearing it off until mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what step is Judas? <laughs> <laughs> that's the step where now you fail and like hang yourself <laughs> not, not repent <laughs> uh, that's uh, admitting admitting you have a problem yeah, first step. It, though. <laughs> that seems like something Peter would do. Uh, right. So, isn't there that bit in one of Paul's writings, maybe Romans, where he talks about you know not being a stumbling block to your brother? And, right. You know, if, mm -hmm. don't drink if it would cause your brother to stumble or whatever. Right. That seems like a lot heavier a charge now. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. I can't drink the equivalent of water. If my, or near my brother who might, who apparently also cannot drink the equivalent of water. Yeah, that, I mean, there were other things at that time that were kind of sticklers. And now there's, I mean, we come more from a Englishy background. I mean, we're practically in London in some cases, you know. But, you know, another, in other words, kind of stiff in some areas. But we are, they are. What? We are. But, yeah, the, you know, okay, an example, if I can go ahead and say this again on Facebook Live, you know, some, several months ago, I was doing what was common at once upon a time with, among us, and I would have a half a cup of wine sitting beside me, and over the, the hour, I would take a sip. And some among us who were visiting that particular night did come again and also talk to others about what we're on. Uh, you know, he, he drinks so wine. Drinking while preaching. Well, yeah, drinking while preaching. So, yeah, you know, I, I haven't done that since, quite honestly, even among just us, because I feel like, you know, shucks, if that kind of threw some folks off, I really probably shouldn't do that. But, you know, I, you know, I, maybe I'm overly sensitive, but yeah. yeah. Because, you know, it's. <laughs> 
people are responsible for themselves. <laughs> they're not respon they're not trying to, you know, make you then they shouldn't be making you into what they want. Uh, and, and and that's that stuff has gone by. I mean, I I'm sure all that's kinda of taken care of by now and so forth, but you know, it got me, I suppose, into a habit. But yeah, you, you don't want to deter people from coming to the Word. Well, no, no. I mean, what we're saying here, we're reading from the book. I, I don't want to, you know, cause me having a cup up here, you know. I don't want that to cause somebody to not be able to hear from the Word of God. So. You mentioned the whole stiff neck thing. That, that's mentioned in the Gospels. Right, when Jesus is talking about the wolves, right? Yeah, hardness of heart. W what does he say? It's well, you're not able to accept this, this you know, married one man married to one woman and so forth because of your hardness of heart. You you can't. It, it, Moses brought up divorce because of your hardness of heart, and basically that's a stiff, you know, unswerving, you know, I got to have it my way kind of position. Uh, well, I didn't want a divorce, and my wife was the one who wanted a divorce. <laughs> but the Bible woman didn't, I guess, uh, had any right to say do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. The way the Bible presents it is, the man finds in her something of, and the Hebrew word meaning she's gone out and prostituted herself, but um, you know, committed fornication. Uh, it's it's assumed that the man has responsibility toward himself, you know, and he, surely he wouldn't go there, but yeah, men go there, far more than women. And apparently, back to the wine versus water thing, mm -hmm. that's a myth. Okay. That's well, a modern creation that people used to substitute wine and beer for water, mm -hmm. but because they didn't have clean water. That's apparently a falsehood. Okay. Uh, uh, even Pliny, the elder, wrote guidelines on how to determine if water was safe to drink or not. Oh, yeah. It was pretty well known back in ancient times what was good water and what wasn't good water. Mm -hmm. um, so they had guidelines, they had customs. It was just such a normal thing that nobody really talked about it. So, no, they didn't substitute wine and beer for, for water in ancient cultures. Although that doesn't change the fact that water would have been difficult to come by. Mm -hmm. Okay. in the desert uh, mm -hmm. in certain other places but um, still though they, they knew how of course if worse comes to worse you get to see water and you boil it mm -hmm. they knew how to boil things and burn things so. basically what I was trying to say there wine, beers, things that are commonly uh, of low alcoholic content and nowadays we have wines that are near 20% alcohol mm -hmm. and stuff you know but we're talking about stuff that would be, you know, at the height of 7% alcoholic nature, uh, probably a little lower than that. Stuff that they weren't drinking it for the alcoholic content. Right. But they were just drinking it because it was a nice little bit to drink, aside from water. But um, anyway, that... Well, even if the water was okay to drink, it probably tasted bad. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it was not going to make you sick. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't have water filtration and stuff like that. Yeah. Or it was muddy. You know? And so, fruit juice is, is filtered, you know, water is filtered by the plant. Mm -hmm. And then you squeeze it out of the grapes or the whatever else you're going to make a fermented beverage out of. But, you know, you've kind of got the nature filtration in a way. So, it would taste probably worlds better. We're not talking about getting bottled water off the shelf or even tap water versus this we're talking about drinking muddy water scooped out of the sand in the desert you know, by digging deep enough it would satisfy in terms of keeping you alive but right. wasn't the first thing you want to go for necessarily all the time okay uh, further in the in the uh, note here Just as Jews have so often been robbed of their belongings, Yeshua's clothing was taken by Roman soldiers. Of course, you know, I mean, for one thing, you got somebody who's, you know, being put to death, he's being executed. For another, yeah, he's this Jewish guy, I mean, goodness, we, we caused them to pay taxes to us. 
Much later manuscripts add, and the passage from the scripture was fulfilled that says he was counted with transgressors, Isaiah 53, 12. Even dividing his clothing by throwing dice is mentioned in Psalm 22, verse 19. Nailing our beloved Lord to the stake, the written statement of crime, was and is forever Melech HaYehudim, King of the Jews. I feel that that statement was not merely a statement for then. That's a statement for, for all eternity. That's the crime committed. Because the Gospels mention the two criminals on either side of our Savior, the Christian custom has been to picture three crosses with the middle one larger than the other two. Of course, we know that long lines of stakes with criminals hung upon them was not out of the ordinary. But, you know, I mean, yeah, my friend is being crucified. I'm going to probably mention those next to him rather than the 100 on this side and the 50 on that side. Continuing with the mob mentality, insults of the mob sort were made use of to the point that other crucified individuals joined in, but it wouldn't be right for someone within a mob to actually engage in their own brain, so generally stupidity reigns for, the, for a necessary time. But, I, okay, if, if I use the word stupid, that literally <laughs> means of a you know, mental stupor. Uh, you, a, mob, a mob mentality is not going to wake up in their own mind and engage their own intellect to really think, hey, uh, what am I doing here? But So this kind of catches on in this position. And of course, when you're in a mob mentality, the first thing you're going to do is deny God. So, I've been in a mob before. The first thing we did was ride an elevator. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, it's like I'm, I'm sure that there are many mobs who uh, don't really care whether they're not communists, and therefore would you know make that a a uh, you know uh, a bullet on a chant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think they would make that a you know one of the checks they have to mark off to uh, you know say all right we successfully mobbed or you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, you can have religious moms too. Well, yeah. The first thing they might shout is, God does it this. Because they <laughs> mow down the opposition. <laughs> you're, I mean, you're, you're helping me make my point. I, I shouldn't have made that joke. Anyway. <laughs> now that I think about it, it's like 49 people died in the mosque today. Yeah. That, you know yesterday. You know what I'm yesterday? trying to say. Yeah. I, thought that was today. Yesterday. Uh, I got the notification yesterday morning. So it was overnight, yeah. Thursday night. It was the time there. Oh, that's probably... Yeah, they are on the other side of the world. Yeah, they're like... I uh, saw your maybe it was nine hours ahead of us, I think. It was in New Zealand. New Zealand, so that's... That's yeah, probably... I, 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 I couldn't remember where it took place, probably so I just saw it there. Yes, yeah, so I don't know where it was. Because they know the world. Yeah. That's so, probably, so it was our Thursday night, so it was probably their Friday morning or something like that. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about time and we're... Uh, apparently, re re willing to talk things over. Yeah, we're talking today. Are you happy? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. All right. Noon until 3 p.m. on Wednesday, AD 31. Is that with or without daylight saving? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you all understand, I think I've said this before, in terms of you know the three days and the, the time, it was a long time ago that folks figured out, you can go, you know, do all your research all the way back. You can figure out the time of day all the way back to a long, long time ago. So the best Passover that fits a weekend resurrection, you know, somewhere between, say, 28 A.D. and 33 A.D., somewhere in there, lands perfectly in A.D. 31. And that Passover Seder night was Tuesday night. Crucifixion Wednesday, and then resurrection. You know, resurrection basically Saturday night. Came early in the morning while it was still dark. He wasn't there. Yada yada. Mm. It came on Sunday. Early? Sunday morning, early in the morning, while it was still dark. Everything was gone. They made sure not to resurrect on the Sabbath. So that'd be work. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll get to that in. Chapter 16. Oh, I won't steal your thunder that you'll have a month from now. 
No, oh, I'm, I'm going to talk about, yeah, a month from now. Um, by the way, well, no, I'm going to go into this. Then I'll say the by the way. Okay. All right. Noon until 3 p.m. on Wednesday, eighty thirty one, And I'll also draw from Amos chapter 8, verse 9 specifically, which mentions, it actually prophesies this particular event. Mark chapter 15, verse 33, whoa, through 39. <laughs> I'm just excited about these verses. <laughs> Mark chapter 15, 33 through 39. I'll go ahead and read it. It doth say here, it says it this way. At noon, darkness covered the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. At three, he uttered a loud cry. Elo, Elohi, Elohi, or Elohi, folks will say. Elohi, Elohi, lama shavaktani, which means, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? from Psalm chapter 22, beginning that psalm. On hearing this, some of the bystanders said, look, he's calling for Eliyahu. Man, really slow on their Hebrew. <laughs> One ran and soaked a sponge in vinegar, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. Wait, he said, let's see if Eliyahu will come and take it down, take him down. But Yeshua let out a loud cry and gave up his spirit. And the parakeet in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw the way he gave up his spirit, he said, This man really was the Son of God. Okay. And this was this is really where I ought to stop, because I'm, I'm getting into stuff that I want to bring into chapter 16. But Thus began the most dark times in Jerusalem until 1967 A.D., of course, we are talking about A.D. 70 until A.D. 1967, with, with the Roman siege of said holy city beginning as early as A.D. 67. So basically, you got exactly 1,900 years between one Holocaust and the rising of the modern Jewish state out of that Holocaust. When a Bible verse is quoted, especially if it you know is the opening line, as it were, the whole text is... The whole text or context is implied when appropriate. That is, Yeshua here refers to the whole of Psalm 22 to himself. In this quotation, the Aramaic version is given. The Hebrew is Eli Eli Lama Azaftani. Both lines translate into English as, My God, my God, why have you abandoned or deserted me? This is this would hardly be a time for dead joke puns, but some did enter said realm. It is Yochanan or John who tells us that, or it tells us what word Yeshua cried out, which is one word. It is kala, the word it is, is thrown into the text. It's for so-called clarification. Kala means both finished and bride, as a bride com completes or finishes her husband. With Yeshua crying out for the joy set before him, what has been called the Hymen Veil, the Veil of, to the Holy of Holies, excuse me, <laughs> was rent from top to bottom. It has actually been called that. Pardon me, I know I'm, uh, I'm among uh, fellas here. <laughs> what? Pardon me, excuse me. I'm, just, I'm reading my notes. Could you please wait? <laughs> Goodness. Okay. I looked at Tal and then I focused back on you and said, pardon me, I'm on fellows here. I, I'm among fellows here. Oh. I, I apologize for the disclarity, the in, um, in clarity or whatever. <laughs> Lack of clarity. Lack of clarity, yes. So, that particular veil, which was called by that terminology, was rent from top to bottom. The centurion standing nearby has often been seen as having converted at this point, although not all of us are completely convinced. Anything, or anyway, it may also be noted that among the Gospels, only Mark uses the Latin term centurion, for whatever that's worth. Beside a mention of Mr. Centurion Dude, most focus, or my focus, is that of our Savior's word of what I believe to be crying out for his bride, to finally join him within or under the chuppah on Shabbat. For neither Adam nor Eve, nor neither Adam nor Havah joined him 
as the seventh day continues to be completely open for all to enter. Do you have the capacity to, quote, keep my Shabbats each week and revere the Lord's sanctuary, i.e. go to church on that day? Do you have that capacity? All, are all things truly possible with God? Can you actually keep the Sabbath and go to church on that day, not just rest? But actually go to church? Do we have the capacity? To, are all things really possible with God? Is it really possible to do that? I don't know. Without God, nothing's possible. You don't know. We're going to figure it out. So, I'm... I'm beginning, I'm, okay, this, this part here is kind of introducing what I really want to go into after next week, actually. But, what uh, are we doing, Nick? Well, next week we're going to Alice? Yes. So here we're talking about, and we'll begin to talk about, this is kind of what I feel Mark is doing here is transitioning. He's going to trans into, transition into resurrection and what re resurrection really is. There's some verses at the last, the, the second half of Mark 16, that are from uh, some later manuscripts, but I'm going to add them while I talk about resurrection and what it is. We talk about bodily resurrection, there's more than bodily resurrection. Okay? And I, I want to talk about that within what Sabbath is. So I'm wanting to develop this idea of, do we have capacity? Is God really all possible? Can, he, can we really do all things with him? And part of the mentality I want to try to bring about, part of the spirit I want to bring about, is what resurrection is. Okay, so I'll stop there with the notes. But any before I close, any other thoughts or questions about these matters? So, so that's what we're doing next week? Okay, next week... Yes, we will be in Marvel. And next week, next Thursday and Friday, is Puro. Oh. So, I, this will be, yeah, this is why I say, yeah, we'll finish up Mark in about a month, and then two months later we finish Mark. But we'll celebrate Purim, you know, as we celebrate Purim. Read through Esther, have a good time. Oh, so we get to, like, Scream and yell whenever we hear Haman's name, right? Yeah. Well, apparently it also means it's the season for, uh, I, I think it was pure and for the weird, like, you know, finally everybody starts asking, you know, ask, they ask questions about, you know, what does the story say about this? And they respond with, you know, it's like, all right, we're going to, you know, take something, you know, wrong, you know, like misinterpret something in it to, mm -hmm. or, you know, overanalyze and such in a humorous fashion or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, well, there, there's a there's a there's a custom within Purim that you know you by cursing Haman you bless Mordecai you bless Israel and you you know that's the one time within Orthodoxy that you get you can you're allowed to go ahead and get tipsy enough where you might not be able to tell the difference between a blessing and a curse and here's the reason and this is actually rather messianic. Believe it or not, the word for bless, Baruch, or the, the verb being Barak, and no, it's not the name of a former president. His name is spelled a little differently, means lightning. But ba Barak is four times in the Bible translated as curse, and in context is translated correctly as curse, because a blessing can be a curse, and a curse can be a blessing. Yeshu is what Jesus was called in the first century. We talked about this at the beginning of Matthew. It's Yesu. It's a Greek try at Yeshu because Greek, Greek didn't have a SH sound. Neither does English. <laughs> we, have, we have to put S next to H. But, you know, it doesn't have a letter for that. Yeah. So we find it as Yesu or Yeshu. Yeshu is also an old curse against Jesus, against Yeshua. It's an acronym for the curse. May his name be obliterated. May his name be blotched out. Yeah. 
So that very curse can become the name by which you're saved. You know, the only name by which you're saved. And it's interesting that Yeshu is minus the ayin, minus the 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 ah at the end, minus the Yeshua, minus the ayin or the open eye. Nowadays, or when we, not then, but nowadays, we are beginning to call him Yeshua with the open eye. Then we will call him when he takes the land. Joshua's name was changed from Hoshea to Joshua or Yehoshua when he was about to take the land. It's when Moses anointed him to take the land and changed his name to Yehoshua. When Jesus comes back, his name will also be elongated, as it were, when he takes the land. What I'm saying is, a curse can become, become all the more a blessing, such a huge blessing that it makes the curse look like a silly thing. Because it is by that very name that we are saved. By that very curse, if you will. So within Purim, it is spoken of as, can you tell the difference between a curse and a blessing? When is that curse actually a blessing? When is that blessing working out to be a curse? You know, so that's that's one of those things that you know Tao is talking about Purim Torah, where you ask questions like that. Now, is this good or bad for us? You know, within the movie, the old movie, the book and the movie are so very different. But the movie uh, Fiddler on the Roof. It's not in the book, I don't believe, but the movie, and the movie says, yeah, you, we're your chosen people, but could you choose somebody else? <laughs> you know, is it a blessing or a curse? So, you yes, ask those kind of questions. So, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk through um, those things next week. Brian will not, he'll be on call. So, you know, if you're, if you're accustomed to riding with Brian to Burville, then you might consider another and work it out. Work, uh, find another way to get there. Well, Tal will drive me and we'll stuff Richard in the bed. <laughs> we'll stuff you in the bed. Because Tal's got that ranger that doesn't have enough. He's got a, pick up, a little tiny pickup. Yeah. Uh, so you get to ride in a pickup bed. Yeah. In the pickup bed? Yeah. <laughs> to Maryville. Yeah. Back. So get you a nice swoopy hairstyle. Yeah. Get yeah. 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 a rebel flag. Yeah, everybody, loves the wind. <laughs> everybody loves the wind blowing. Yeah. We, and uh, real with week after next, we will finish with Mark. We will finish with Mark the week after next. And then, as I said a couple of months ago, Becky will then present something that I've been asked to present since 2010. And I'm back to that place of working full-time so that I my hours for doing this are slim. So I'll, be, I'll happily sit aside and say, yeah, I agree with you for a month or two. And that'll also give me bits of time to work on Luke. So she will present uh, the history of Israel, which will amount to why should any and all Christians be supportive of Israel today? And who will do that now? My wife, Rebecca, will make that presentation. She just took it upon herself out of the interest of doing so. That's good. She got tired of waiting on you to do it. Yeah, she got it's, it's pretty much it. <laughs> she is one of those that really kind of pressed, wanted me to make that presentation. And here I am on the way to Sabbath meetings at that time on Saturday mornings, often making my sermon notes. I was presenting sermons at that time rather than just going through a book. And I was often making notes at that time on my way to our meetings. And so, you know, I'm kind of back in that really spot of one it is really actually she drove so I could do that but um <laughs> so we begin uh, she'll make that presentation I she says it'll be a month I I would say three or better but cause you know we talk things over and that's good oh yes I should pardon me so let's let's pray um Oh, she's on. Thank Arnold S. and I'm Bach.
I'm back. I'm I'm back. She's yeah. You know, she's she is saying that she is not watching. Yeah. Just in a you joke sort of uh, way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Say no bad jokes. And Samuel Cox was watching it. Wonderful. I I actually referenced him earlier, or actually didn't call him by name, but referenced the vision when we started that he had had. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm talking too much again. Goodness, y'all. Can you? It's just somewhere along the way. Say, Ron, shut up. Tried before. <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, again, Avinu Shabbat Shemayim Yekadesh Mekatovum Alkutuka Yaseu Sonka Kavashemayim Kim Baharitz. We love you and thank you for this time. We we love our family, uh, our friends, our family here, and ask that all of the uh, all of those not merely those who are keeping the Sabbath, but those who are meeting on Sunday. I I don't want to sound as if not at all as if I'm dissing that either last night when we almost brought that up or tonight. Father, we just ask that you. We trust that you are blessing your people everywhere. And again, grateful for friends and family both being the same thing on on the the the, the Facebook Live and, and here tonight. Thank you again. Bashem Yeshua in Jesus' name. Amen. You were just showing off at the beginning, weren't you? Was I? Yeah, just wrapping off like two dozen.